Derek, if, if you are a child, your parents tell you not to not not to spit on the street, and then and then you buy some wine, you pay money, and then you spit it. Yeah. yeah? Okay. You got it. <laughs> you got it. Yeah. <laughs> Go and spit on the street. I'm Derek Morrison from the Good Wine Shop, and welcome to a new episode of Bring Your Own. Austria is one of the most exciting wine producing countries, and I'm constantly amazed by the diverse wines finding their way into the market. Provocative winemakers combined with impressive terroir is a great combination to achieve transcendent wines. And for this episode, we were lucky to have three of Austria's most inspiring growers with us to share their stories and wines from their own cellars. Joining us today are growers Evel Cepe of Weingut Verlich, Christian Chita, and Klaus Preisinger, as well as head sommelier of Nuala restaurant Honey Spencer. Special thanks to the great team at Farah at Claridge's, one of London's most exciting restaurants and located one of the most iconic hotels, we were fortunate to occupy the test kitchen dining space for our conversation. Find them on Instagram at Farah at Claridge's. If you enjoy the episode, please take a moment to give a review online. Follow us on social media at BYO Podcast and share this episode with your friends. Hi everyone, thanks for coming tonight. Thanks for joining us to uh, celebrate some fantastic wines and to... Uh, um, hear a bit more about uh, um, the work that you guys are doing in, in uh, various parts of Austria with your own wines. Um, it's a pretty special episode that we get to have um, three growers um, with us today. Um, I work with each of your wines and I have a great adulation for, for all of you, so it's really special to have you guys here. And um, um, Why don't we just go around the, around the bar quickly and uh, for some quick introductions and tell us a bit about uh, who you are, where you're from and uh, what you do. And uh, We'll start with you, Klaus. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm from the Burgenland area, what is the, the most east uh, region for wine growing in, in Austria. Also, I think the, the hottest place uh, to grow. That's why I focus mainly on red grapes, but I only do some experimental uh, white wines with very long um, skin maceration in amphoras, different other things, pet nuts, yeah, whatever I'm in the mood for. Right, and uh, Evel. Yes, hello everybody. I am from Styria, which is on the borderline to Slovenia, so southeast of Austria. I would say more or less we are more a, a white wine region, so 80% whites, 20% reds. I work mainly in white cuvées, so I work with Chardonnay and Sauvignon on my different types of soil. Cool, Christian. Hello everybody, uh, my name is Christian Chida. Uh, I come from Burgenland like Klaus, uh, but I'm even more closer to the Hungarian border. So uh, I often go to Hungary as well. <laughs> That's fun. And uh, we do half-half, uh, white wines and red wines. But uh, I would not be able to categorize it now in one sentence, what we really do. You, we should taste it. Thanks. And uh, honey. Hi. I'm Honey Spencer. I'm a, a Londoner. I'm a sommelier at a new restaurant called Nula, which is in the city. Um, and But actually, I have a big history with these wine growers uh, and their wines, which is why I'm here. Let's get into it then. Why don't we, we start tasting some wine? So each of you has brought a bottle of something, not the wine that you make, um, to, to share something that you enjoy that's uh, going to give us some insights as to uh, what you're into um, wine-wise. Um, and so Honey and I have uh, brought a selection of uh, wines that uh, you do produce. So why don't we start there to uh, go through the wines. And uh, Klaus, you've got uh, um, one of your reds that you make. So why don't we start with, start with that? <clears throat> yeah, I brought uh, tonight the uh, Kalken Kiesel Red. It's, um, I mean, the name is from the, the soil types what I work with. So Kalk is the, the limestone. And uh, Kiesel, it's a, it's a gravel. It's a, it's a round pebbly uh, stone built by the Danube. And um, in this case, it's uh, the 2016 uh, version. Here I use uh, two of my oldest vineyards. One is from 1954 and one from the late uh, 60s. They were planted red, and then, I don't know, maybe by accident it, it happened by uh, a frost issue, um, and then they replanted it with some uh, white wines. So it's a, like a field blend vineyard of uh, uh, mainly red, but also like 25-30% uh, white uh, grapes in it. So mainly the reds, Blaufränkisch, St. Laurent, a little bit of Zweigelt. 
<coughs> and the reds are the whites are uh, really a mixed up of uh, Welsh Riesling, Müller Thurgau, uh, Grüner Weltliner, eating grapes, some foxy Americano, uh, uh, funky grapes in. And uh, in the past I did it separately. So I've uh, picked the, the whites and then the reds. And nowadays I just go into the vineyard and take it at once. Uh, Co-fermentation, uh, whole bunch fermentation, and then yeah, just press after a few days and uh, keep it in, in old used barrels till springtime and then bottle it right away. Great. Um, why don't you pour us all a little bit and we'll yeah. have a taste. And Look at the color. So the idea uh, that the white grape brings also like more these, these light uh, flavors and aromas into the blend and uh, 11.5 in alcohol, uh, no extraction. So it's my idea of a uh, very easygoing red, but also on the other hand with a lot of uh, complexity. It's definitely a wine to be drunk. I mean, it's, as you said, it's got a lot of, uh, there's a lot more, it's, it's so pleasant and, uh, and enjoyable. I mean, that's my principal idea of producing wine. Just to, to drink. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, other guys they, they do it to uh, to store it and yeah. But you must have known that because you haven't left us any spittoons. Uh, I, I don't believe in so spittoons. So you must have anticipated <laughs> that this is wine for drinking. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's not really um, not really in our DNA, spittoons. I mean, we're more about drinking than. People ask often, is this wine for keeping? Mm. I say, yeah. Oh, How long a, you can keep a, the wine? What a question. Yeah. For keeping. <laughs> I mean, I think that, you know the UK market can be maybe um, and has been kind of uh, uh, laughed at in the past that it's uh, the um, the necrophiliacs of the wine world, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it's an exercise in ageability more than it is in um, um, appreciating and enjoying wines at its best. And I'm not saying that everyone is, but that's certainly you know you hear that from commentaries from other markets. And you know, we had a we had a conversation in, um, recently it was about you know what is what makes a great wine and does it need to be does a wine need to be ageable to be a great wine? I mean, a, a, when you enjoy drinking a wine, you enjoy drinking a wine, right? I mean, it's, why should you have to prolong the satisfaction for a wine just for some sort of external measurement? I mean, it doesn't matter. It, I, I mean, but on, this, on the same hand, this, this wine have, has a, a great balance and why it, this wine should not age for years, yeah. so. This is great, it's a very vibrant, energetic wine, but it's, you know, it's so pleasant that you overlook maybe some of the complexities of it. I think there is a, a bit of a shift in the paradigm now of, of drinkers, especially younger drinkers. They want to enjoy wines, maybe with a touch lower alcohol and, you know, these young chefs, you know, let's, let's talk about London, you know, that are kind of reinventing British cuisine. And, and so drinkers, they want this same kind of sense of like provenance, a sense of place. They, they don't want wines that are overly oaked. Um, like you know, Christian's wines, or and or maybe they want wines that 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 have no uh, oak influence at all. Like maybe some of your stuff that you work that you work with work with Amphora. And um, but no, I, I I mean from a from a sommelier and trade perspective, I am seeing this really big shift of 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 taste. You know, people aren't worrying so much about aging wines. I think maybe that is a of course there's always going to be a certain type of person that that wants to age a wine and wants to have that conversation. But a lot of people now are just really kind of enjoying drinking wine and, and, and everything that goes with that. I, I think it kind of comes to this conversation about appreciating a wine and what it's supposed to be and what that wine is trying to express. And some wines, it takes a decade to express what is the essence of that wine or that site's going to be. I mean, we're, we're, not, we're tasting the ex 2 from Evel today, but we also tasted the 2006 ex 2 which yeah. is, you know, I mean, it's 12-year-old white wine that is, you know, <laughs> it's not... It's, it's just the beginning of its life at the same time. So, I mean, it's, but, but the thing is, is that, you know, do we, there's no one size fits all. There's no one measure for every wine. And, and um, I, it's, I think it's very true what you're saying that you know, people are looking for wines to drink and the wines you want to drink have some vibrance and some energy and freshness and, and, um, and life in them, not, uh, um, and that, you know, aren't overbearing that you can finish a bottle of, not that you drink a glass and it's 17% alcohol and it's uh, mm -hmm. um, more of an exercise. Drinking in... uh, concrete. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so Christian, uh, why don't you, we've got a, um, a, a bottle from you. Why don't you tell us a bit about uh, the bottle we've brought on your behalf? Oh, yes. Uh, 
it's called non-tradition, also in English non-tradition. Uh, it's also um, <clears throat> a white wine existing with the, with the same working title. Uh, now we have the red one. It's Cabernet Franc, which is quite unusual uh, for the Bungland, but uh, uh, on one of my travelings in the past, I really fell in love with the uh, Cabernet Franc of Loire, mm -hmm. which is uh, no wonder <laughs> they, they are formidable. Yeah. Um, and then I thought about it. Uh, yes, I, I love this taste, I have the floral, and uh, also this, uh, this certain freshness they always have. I was there in Loire, uh, I think uh, it was 11 years ago, and I was attending a tasting. This was very interesting for me, and this was the, the thing. I was attending a tasting of 30 years, uh, Bordeaux, Cabernet Franc based uh, uh, wines next to Loire, Cabernet Franc, maybe 100% or also based wines. And in every vintage, I think every second, uh, the Loire was nicer than, you know, always in the, in the warmer ones. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the Cabernet Franc then came from Loire very, very fresh. And yeah. So this was the, uh, the point zero. And then I found out that one um, in my neighborhood of the vineyards, um, someone uh, had some uh, mallow planted many, many years ago. And he was not happy with this mellow. And I knew why, because it was Cabernet Franc. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> no sweetness. Yes. Yeah. So he, he said, this is, uh, I don't know what's wrong with this mellow, but there, there is no power in it. And it's always that floral touch. I don't know. And I said, yes, maybe if you want to get rid of it, of this mellow, I, I need some mellow. <laughs> and so this was uh, the ignition for my first Cabernet Franc vineyard. <laughs> and this is now 10 years ago, and yeah, we made many, many different uh, varieties of Cabernet Franc. I tried Error, tested, and we bottled a lot. And so this is now uh, what I think, what I like most in Cabernet Franc. It's a um, 15 vintage. It has been, in the end, a bit uh, warmer finish during, um, during the ripeness. So, uh, also in this, you can see what it is worth to have old wines and deep roots because you do not feel any heat of, the, of, the, of this vintage. And this is always for me a big thing to, um, to see that something is going right. Huh? If you don't have a, a wine that is boring and uh, this overwhelming, uh, you know, this, this power, if it's straight and clear. And uh, this is what we have now. Fantastic. And what is very nice, I think we serve it a bit chilled. So you have more fine aromas. It's more filigree wine instead of having, uh, like we said before, I found it quite nice, the concrete on the pellet. Mm -hmm. huh? Yes. Christian, who, who were these Cabernet Franc producers in Loire that you were looking to? Is it more like a Clos Richard or? All of them, yeah. Philippe Allier, Clos Richard, yeah. all these, the old guys. Yeah, of Loire, yeah. yes. I have to be honest, I'm all, I've always been very inspired by France. Yeah. Your wines are really interesting because you have a mix of, um, of indigenous grapes, uh, mm -hmm. autochthonous to Austria, and then you have some, um, you know, Cabernet Franc, your Syrah, mm -hmm. um, and so you kind of have no, are those, do you think in your mind, you're inspired by the wines of France? I, I, your Syrah, I think, is absolutely beautiful wine. And for me, I like to put it blind to people in like, Côte Rôtie tastings yes. kind of thing. I think, um, if you want to have um, spaghetti puttanesque in the glass, Syrah is the right grape for this. You okay. know? So I like spaghetti puttanesque on the table and on the plate, so also in the glass. You know what I mean? The, yes. the olives, mm -hmm. the dark olives yeah. and... Yeah, yeah, this, uh, yeah, I'm starving. And the meat, you know, the meaty. If, if you're hungry, drink some Syrah. <laughs> it's, like, it's like meat. So, I mean, with, um, with, your, with your wines, did you have... Um, you have, you, you know, you do some very interesting things with your autochthonous grapes, uh, the laissez-faire. Yep. Um, for me, it was my epiphany wine that I had of, of your wines. It was the first wine I had from mm -hmm. you, which was uh, uh, at Eau Bouffes in Vienna. Mm -hmm. And um, it just stopped me in, the, in my tracks when I tasted it because it has this amazing texture. And um, I mean, obviously, by the, the French impl inspiration in the name itself, but it's the Pinot Bianco. Yes, you it's Pinot Blanc. Austria, it's called Weissburgunder. 
and uh, I found out after many, many years of uh, making wine, if you as a winemaker, you make two steps back, the wine is making one step forward. And this is what I call method laissez-faire. You win more if you take yourself out of this, out of this strange game called winemaking. Yeah. Be cool and step back. And the wine is doing good. Yeah. This is what I, I try to do. In 99%, it works well. Uh, and I think that's kind of the, the harmony with the three of you here today. I mean, all of you make very different wines from each other, but yeah. I think if there's one uniting thread, it's that kind of harmony you have with the way you interpret and respect uh, the raw materials and the earth and the vineyards that you, that you work with. And I think that's really fascinating to see that sometimes I think that when people look at this new wave or new generation of winemaking around the world, the, 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 the hands-off or this kind of respective approach can sometimes be misconstrued as radical or one-dimensional in that they try to fit everyone into one box. But when you really see the expressions that result from those funky. lines. Yeah. Funky. Funky. Yeah, I mean, is there anything funky about this Cabernet this, Franc? This, this, it's, it's so polemic, this argument, but you know, this, we call it new wave of winemaking, but this is the way it was always done. You know, people so, listening exactly. to the vines and, and then taking a step back. It's, it's crazy that I'm still having this argument now, but it makes so much, it just makes sense, you know? The, you know, you're not wine, I mean, I don't know if you agree, but you're not wine makers, you're wine growers. You're, most of your work is in the vineyard. And then, as Christian was saying, you just step back and listen. And, and, and actually, like you were saying, Edward, earlier, like if there's a small something, if you need to help at any stage, you know, you can, you can do that. But, and I think this wine, it's, I mean, and also yours, Klaus, it speaks volumes. You know, it's so pure. There's an kind of idiosyncratic element of this wine. It has so much personality. It's so different, but it... You saw yeah. this Klaus, he had 11 and a half alcohol. This one has 12 yeah. and a half. Yeah. So, so everything what the wine needs. Yes, yeah. Yeah. that's way enough. Um, so, Evel, do you want to tell us a bit about uh, um, your wine and we'll uh, give us all a taste as well? Yeah, I would love to. And uh, now, I can show you a white. It's it's named X Vera Two, um, which is a cuvee of Sauvignon Chardonnay. When I took over the the winery in 2004, I let's say in a way I was fed up with with the wines I I, I used to work with in in Styria. So it was just like um, it was just about the wine for me. So that's that's the reason probably why I started with the cuvees don't work uh, on single wines and it was like um, sometimes I'm, I'm now I'm thinking it, there could be an easier way to do it with cuvées <laughs> to start a winery new up with with cuvées because it's 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 abs absolutely not uh, easy to to place it on the market but for me it's a it's just the perfect uh, possibility to express what's going on on my on my piece of land um, just to show the different uh, appearance of the terra or of, of the soil on my hill. And yes, so I mainly grow Sauvignon and, and Chardonnay and I just put them together. And the combination I think is, is, is quite interesting, what, what's coming out of it. Here I, I, I brought the x 2, uh, which comes from the middle part of the wines. Uh, it's based on Sauvignon and a little bit with Chardonnay together. And yeah, I, I pour it in the glass and then you, you can have a, a taste on it. There's a extra one and three as well, or? Yes, so I have three three main cubes. This is x one, two and three, and it's like you climb up the hill. One is the bottom line, two is the middle line, and x three is the top line of, of the hill. When I started to, to, to build up my own style of wine or my own winery, it was really like to, I, I never had a, a picture of a market in my mind or, or what is the perfect wine or it was just about my vineyard and how could it express as its best. And for that, at that time, it was just like uh, use traditional methods, uh, put it in wood barrels and uh, just you work with time and wood because the wood barrel, the wine has ability natural to please and, and build out whatever is inside. And 
when I started, I remember really when I started in 2004, it was like I had no idea what I'm really doing. <laughs> uh, now, after doing wines like this for a couple of years, I really realize what it is or, or what it shows. What I really like in wines is texture and structure. So I'm, I'm not really the just easy going wine. Wine don't have to be heavy and rich, but it has to have this ability, this drinkability, this freshness in it. Um, and the more complex, I like it a lot. And, but when there is a certain kind of lightness, freshness and holiness in, in expression of flavors, it's, it's what I like a lot in drinking. It's a kind of contrast within itself, right? That kind of uh, the paradox of tension and like seriousness and, and um, that captivating um, grabs your attention on the palate and it's chiseled structure but then it's still fresh and light and you know ethereal in a sense that's making it quite drinkable so it's this kind of push and pull it's, it's very nice. and we should note we you know on purpose we tasted a couple of the reds before this one because you have a bit of uh, there's a bit of maceration and you're getting quite a, a serious uh, um, there's quite a serious texture and tension and, um, and, and intensity to the wine that... Uh... There is no maturation in that wine, no. but I find out in the way I process the wine, so just... Uh, you can really mix it up. So we started with the reds and you drink afterwards the whites. I, I see no problem with you. No. And, and the red, I tasted from Christian or from, from you. Uh, yeah, I see no, no, no problem. The old rules, uh, white before red, I think it, it don't... It's not important for this type of wines. So. I don't think there are any rules anymore. I, I, know, I say that to people all the time. Like, if you wanna, you wanna do it the way you wanna do it, that's fine. You know, the the, the most important thing is the enjoyment. Mm. As long as your way of drinking doesn't Im impinge that, then it's fine. But something really important about this particular wine is that it's annoying because you know, uh, you know, we, you can see us and you can hear us, but what you can't do is taste. And this is so ridiculously different from any Chardonnay Sauvignon. <laughs> Uh, that most people have tried, you know, it's got this like electric note in it. I mean, mo loads of notes. It's, there's so many different dimensions to the wine. Um, and I don't know, I, I'm guessing it's something to do with your terroir in Styria because it's this, this crazy high acidity, this like almost like petroleum notes. So very different um, to anything that, like I say, most people have even gone near. One of, one of the things I always think about with your wines, and you, you, know, you said yourself, is uh, about tension and structure and, and freshness. And whenever I'm drinking the Verlage vines, I, I, I don't think of varieties. I don't think of grapes. I'm thinking of what's obviously expressed from that site in this, in this chiseled structure and, and, and intensity and freshness. And you know, this is the 2012 that we're tasting. Yes. Um, you know, but we also have the 2006 on the market. We tasted them side by side today, and it's it's amazing to see. You know, it's obvious when you taste this to see the structure and tension and the longevity that's able by that intensity of of, uh, of posture. But um, when you taste the 2006, you you forget even when you're tasting that that you're tasting a 12 year old wine because it's just it has the same personality and very similar profile to the wine in front of you. It's still very primary, it's still very yeah. fresh and live. It's still, you know, and I think it's just uh, you know, Styria is a very extreme dramatic kind of uh, um, region in terms of what is the terroir there and I think this is um, and I think when you have such a, a dramatic terroir that that is above all else what's going to express through the wines you make and, and I think this wine is very much a reflection of that and, and you see in Styria and, and some, in some of the other wines that you're making but this is always for me in your portfolio this is the wine that just really gets me excited because I think it says something uniquely about um, what you're doing in Styria that um, can't be replicated anywhere else. I can't think of, a, of anywhere beyond where you are that is, can achieve something like this from, from these grapes and this combination and I think that's, that's what gets me excited. In this the only place that I would go anywhere near to comparing and you should never ever compare wines but, but, but some of the work of like early, early Didier Dagano, mm. like that crazy high acidity in Fruli Fume and what he was doing but I don't know. And I think with Dagano as well, in the same w sense, the, his wines transcended the variety. Just in that like electric acidity, yeah. but with everything, all the other elements of the wine situated so so perfectly around. Yeah, it's a different different terroir, but it's definitely saying something. It doesn't have this Sauvignon-esque uh, yeah. flavor style. Huh? No, I, I mean that's why when you uh, for that's me when I, I like taste it. the wine, I forget yeah, yeah. I forget entirely the grape I'm drinking. I'm just thinking about 
the uh, that kind of electricity of uh, that that tension and freshness and uh, that that uh, I mean this is maybe a weird thing to say but when you lick a battery <laughs> if okay. if you lick a battery um, and you get that kind of like, wow lick batteries. <laughs> maybe you had better babysitters in parenting than me but uh, <laughs> if you left them out so and it gives that kind of body. zinging kind of it really grabs you a bit with uh, uh, the tension and I think that's, yeah, uh, that's true. Well, that's maybe really we cool. should try it at home. Yeah, really yeah. Cool. next, uh, <laughs> I brought a bottle of <laughs> batteries. <laughs> Which batteries do you recommend? There's yeah. a 9 volt, to the square uh, batteries. The 9 volt, okay. They're really you can, <laughs> undeniable. So guys, next wine is from my neighbor's table from today's newcomer wines fair. It's from Alto Adige or South Tyrol. Um, it's called uh, Vino Rosso Leggero from uh, Pranzek, the guy is called uh, Martin Goya, and it's like an uh, upside down idea of a, of a wine. So he is pressing the red grapes directly using some Pinot, I think, and some Lagrein. Um, and then he puts the fresh, fresh juice on, uh, on white skins, uh, what he okay. pressed before. And, and then it's also like kind of a pet nut style, so bottled early with some re residual sugar to finish fermentation in the, in the bottle. It's a kind of a easygoing summer wine. And it was the first uh, glass today on the fair. That's why I thought it's a nice idea to bring it to you guys. If all my summers tasted like this, I would be very happy. Just imagine sitting outside, 25 degrees, sunglasses. Yeah. Obviously, you guys do a lot of, you have to go to a lot of markets to promote your wines, you have to do a lot of these fairs. Um, but when you're at home, what's the kind of stuff that you typically drink? I'm also very related to, to France, and uh, particular the Jura area. And uh, I like uh, Trousseau, I like Pulsar. Um, some producers like uh, uh, La Bay, uh, Cavarodes, yeah. yeah. But the same, the same idea to to have wines with a, at, the, at the very low alcohol point, mm -hmm. and still have a lot of uh, density and this this crystalline uh, style. I mean, it's, Jura is a, a funny mention because, you know, we just tasted the reds before the whites and in the Jura, yeah, they, it's very typical. They drink yeah. the reds yeah. and then the whites. The reds are nice in structure. So it's, um, um, we, did a, we did an episode of Jura and we tasted um, um, some really fun wines and uh, the wines from La Bay are fantastic. And, um, but uh, and I think that's, that parallels a great articulation of you can have complex, really interesting, unique wines that are very naturally low and, and um, in alcohol and having a lot of complexity without having to be overworked or overdone. But, but in principle this, this movement takes place all over the world. Okay. So you find so many interesting wines right now from Australia, what everybody thinks it's super hot and, and, and way too dry. And uh, South Africa guys. South Africa, yeah. yeah. California, California, yeah. yeah. Mm. And I think it's just this, again, what we've been talking about, this, this um, I don't want to say counterculture because, as you say, it's got roots in you know the traditional ways of making wine, where it became it went from. I think we're getting away from it being an, a bodybuilding exercise or a competition in some sort of technical um, yeah. who can drive the fastest without yeah, falling off the lane. To how do we get back to what is the essence of kind of like the wines that we make and the wines that we drink? And I think that's that's pretty interesting. It's a question also, of, you know, extraction. You know, I know that Christian, you you. You press quite lightly on, on your grapes and, and I think, you know, let's say, I don't know, since since our parents, you know, there's been this real this real like uh, passion for extraction and, and alcohol and body because it's almost like a kind of getting the most from your money kind of thing. A lot of people I mean, a lot of people that I've served in the past, I won't say where I worked, but they say like how much alcohol is in the wine and then you say oh, this much and they say oh, we want it to be the most possible because they think you know they want to get drunk or whatever but like I was saying before there is now this shift um, where yeah, they want to drink as much yeah, as possible they want to get their they want to get their money's worth but I think now there is this really big shift towards these kind of lighter extractions yeah but it, it's reverse 
if you have a wine with 12 alcohol, you can drink even more. <laughs> so it's a new calculation. <laughs> this is what we were all thinking, but not saying the whole time. <laughs> no, I think it's really interesting too. I mean, you know, with each of you, you made very, you know, Dis decisive um, or philosophical or how, however you came to your decision and the wines you wanted to create and um, it was a departure from uh, I don't want to say necessarily countercultural but certainly in terms of what else is going on in, in, in Austria and even within your own um, regions within Austria each of you is doing something very different and um, now each of your wines are very celebrated uh, um, uh, and revered by people like us in, 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 in the trade but uh, one of the things that always fascinates me with winemakers and producers who have such a, uh, I think this is the thing that doesn't get celebrated or maybe addressed directly enough is how special and how important that um, that perseverance and dedication you have because it must have been in the beginnings when you, each of you started to make your decisions about how to make the wines. It must have been difficult at first, no? I mean, in terms of you had to create a market for your wines. There wasn't necessarily something, it was something inside of you that was that was guiding you into the wines that you wanted to make, but um, can you maybe just shed any light? Is it, uh, uh, am I right? Am I wrong? Is there, was it, what was it like in the early days when you started to make your wines, and uh, did you ever question, or have, how did that challenge you? You want to hear the yeah. truth? Yeah. <laughs> yes. yes. I, I was not telling anybody how I do the wine. It was a secret, a big secret, because uh, it, w it would have been a big... Uh, big thing in Austria if you say okay we don't have a distemmer we are not using this and that methods uh, how ca can you make wine like this this would have been a big uh, a big scandal. scandal somehow yes and now it's reverse I get many phone calls about consulting how can we do spontaneous fermentation we cannot do it it doesn't work I say yes but it's not uh, I cannot tell you on the phone how to do spontaneous. You know, it's it happens or not. Yeah, you know, it's, it's very. Irony yes. Look in, the, <laughs> you know. look in the dictionary. The word yes. spontaneous. <laughs> but you know how it is. Yes. Yeah. Now it's reverse. Now these these ideas are high, highly highly level, but uh, but in the early days, it w I, I had to. Uh, lucky wise, I was discovered somehow. Yes, and then everything went up, but uh, if, you, if, if I would have been only in Austria, I would not sit here now, I would be, I don't know. Would you say that you're celebrated more inside Austri Austria or outside Austria? It's not a matter of celebration, yeah. it's a, I think it's a matter of um, interest yeah. in something uh, beside the roads, you know, yeah. uh, beside the, the driven paths already. But, but you get it more from outside? It's yeah, way easier, yeah, I, I mean, here or in the Scandinavian countries yeah. or even abroad. I think it's, it's interesting just to understand how you grew up as a, like in my case, as a, on a wine farm and you go in school and you have tr traditional uh, education for producing wine and they try to, to give you everything, what is the perfect wine and how to make it and what it is and, and you learn this everything. And then you start tasting wines and you taste up and down and then you make experience that you taste wines which you like most, you find out, then you start thinking how, how are the wines processed and then you find out they, they just do it very in a very natural approach. It's, it's not about the newest machines you use and the newest technique, it was just the wines moved me. So and then you start doing it your own and then you find out colleagues coming to your cellar and tasting your wines and they just taste and they wow. what is this <laughs> this, is just, this is not wine you can't drink it just pour it just open it and uh, your 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 your, your bearers and and just just throw it away and then think okay uh, what is going on right now and, and it doesn't this, taste like this yeast it doesn't yeah. taste yes, like yeah this. exactly it's not and and as a small producer it's really that, that, that's a big investment to have all the machinery and all the technical supplies to, to make the perfect wine you learned in school. And here you find out, and I, and I always felt not comfortable with this. And then you just start going on and then the big luck is you find colleagues like I have here left and right of mine where you can go and talk and 
okay, you're not the only crazy boy in the world. <laughs> there are some more, and then you go outside of Austin and see, okay, yeah, there, well, is there, there is much more. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there is much more. No, it helps a lot. You get yeah. more the, the, the comfortable feeling when when you have colleagues around you. What a would I have the, the same, on the same path? Yeah. Just people that kind of, well, I think that's interesting because you see kind of when you d see these different fairs and this kind of harmony you find with, it was, we just talked about some people from Australia and South Africa and California and uh, Southern Jura and other parts of France and Loire, that there's this kind of harmony, that kind of camaraderie that you find that is kind of helps to provide some encouragement, I guess, to yourselves in terms of w positive acknowledgement that you, I'm on the right track or to continue that, be that belief in what you're doing? I May I just tell you a story of mine? And you, sometimes you start making your wines and when I start selling it, I had no market for my type of wines and I don't take care of market when I start producing it. But then I had it in a bottle and then I have to start thinking, okay, what is the right place to put it? And it's, it's really funny and then you bring it and quite often the people are coming, this is not typically Sauvignon. A student Sauvignon don't taste like this. Wine should taste like this. And then they tell you what you have done wrong. And sometimes there were only one or two people you met in a year who say, look, this is really exceptional stuff. And you really get stuck on this. Only a few people at the beginning who, who come and say, look, you are not stupid. This is really something different and special. And you get stuck on this and not on all the others who are coming and telling you what you are doing right or wrong. And it's really, for me now, I'm, I'm wondering when I, I can laugh now when you look back. But when you're in the middle of the process, it's in Austria, it's not, I, I don't feel so comfortable and easy that it's just... Yeah, just do it. Now it's easy because it's it has a certain level where people accept it and they just go for it. So Christian, uh, um, tell us a little bit what you brought and uh, why you brought it. Yes, I I brought some uh, very nice Riesling from for me the most most let's say it conservative wine region in the world, the Mosel, <laughs> Germany, Mosel, uh, and there is one guy who is, I don't know how to say it in the, the, the real wide way, but I call him the last Mohigan. <laughs> and uh, his name is Rudolf Trossen. He's around 60 years old, and he's cooler than all the other uh, guys. The first Mohican. The first, <laughs> yes. Or the first Mohican, yes. The first and the last in one person. Yeah. No, to be honest, uh, this is fantastic choose because he's against the wall in the Mosel region, and he's, to me, I mean, maybe there is somebody else, but I think I know that he's the only one who is doing Riesling in a dry way. Uh, it has 11.5 alcohol, and it's absolutely drinkable, and no sugar, and no, no nothing, yes. And it's um, 16 oil called Purus. I also want to say to everyone who is listening to this, uh, it's worth it to search for the exception of the region uh, of, yeah. or of the exceptions. Maybe I believe in every region there are, are two or three guys or in this maybe one, but there is always an exception of everything yeah, who is doing things very different. And it's worth it to discover them. And then, like me, really, I'm happy. At the moment, I mean, we have this in the glass. But I'm absolutely into um, Elsass, Alsace, Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. I got crazy about this. You know, Julien Maya, Pinot Noir, yeah. you can drink like nothing else. Huh? Well, I, I for, example, for example, yeah. so search for the exception. And most, the, the more conservative regions are, the more reverse and other, yeah. you know, in, in, there is a, a part against this, then there is yeah. a guy or a woman who is doing the exception. Well, I think it's really interesting because we, we, we cling to absolutes uh, in the wine industry. We're always, it's such a complex 
tapestry that people are always looking for. What is the black and white yeah. answer? Mm -hmm. How can I define this area so I can move on to studying the next area? How can we fit it inside the square and then be done with it? It's so true. And I think this, and I think all of us in our own have a journey with wine is, you, I always say to people, you go through these peaks and plateaus where, uh, okay, I think I've learned everything. I've now I've mastered wine. And then you realize you taste something, you're like, I don't know anything. And then you climb up again, you're like, okay, now I've figured it out. And you taste something and you realize, oh, and then you taste something else. I don't know anything. And I think the, the sooner you stop looking for absolutes in wine, the sooner you start kind of actually enjoying and understanding wine better. But Derek, it starts already in the I mean, education. They tell me uh, for this region, these three uh, grape varieties are typical. They tell me da 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 da. And I say, yes, uh, did you taste the wine of this region? No, but uh, the, re the, the, the grapes are like this. So I think it's more important to taste and maybe drink and drink and maybe drink one glass too much or one bottle too much than just in the theory yeah. uh, think about the top the top, uh, the well-known producers of the world, you know? Yeah, you need to learn and then yes. unlearn. Yes. The same as in winemaking school. They yes. teach you everything and then you throw it out. Yes. So Eva, why don't you uh, pour us a little bit of uh, the wine you brought and then tell us a bit about it. Yes, because I'm grown up on the borderline to Slovenia. So of course there is a relation to, to my neighbor country, Slovenia. I, I think now we are on the topic of orange wine, whatever it means. Um, but uh, I brought Alex Klinitz, uh, a Marvazir from Alex Klinitz, which is a producer I, I really like a lot because with orange wines, it's, for me, it's like, it's so-so. It's, it's, not, it's not that easy for me, but if it is an orange wine done in a, in a good way, it is something I really love to drink. And Alex Klinitz, Cleanets made made really a good or give me a good experience in in drinking orange wine when we when we visit the the region there and we had the whole day orange wine from one producer to the next and in the evening we came into his, his winery and we are already just done f for for lie in the bed and 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 go for the night but then I like said look first come sit and sit together we have to talk and he opened one bottle and the next and the next and at the end we, <laughs> we emptied a couple of bottles and it was just like an experience I, I don't had so often so that's the reason why I choose for an orange wine because uh, it could be something so drinkable if it is done in the proper way. Yeah. Oh, it's beautiful I mean always with orange wines or these macerated wines I think that that skin maceration can lend a really nice softness when you have such powerful, intense terroir. And the same with your own wine. I think it, um, you do a, a, an orange wine, uh, as you say, and I think that combination of that texture that you get from the maceration on the skin or that extraction, when uh, you have such defined terroir, I think really gives a nice balance to the wine and you really feel it here. It's very saline, very tense, very, very long in the palate. But Oh, it's a beautiful one. For me as a producer, because of course I'm, I'm a winemaker, I'm thinking 24 hours a day about wine. And really? When I'm sleeping. Yeah, maybe, yeah. yeah. <laughs> In a way, yes. yes. But it, it, it's funny, so because <laughs> with orange wines, I had this, 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 in a way, it shocked me when I tasted it for the first time. Everything I learned, I, I, I got my first orange wine, I, I, I went, what is this? Everything I don't like in the wine was my first orange when wine. When was it? I think it was in 2000. And it was, like a, me. It was a wine from Josko Grauna and yeah. Radical. Like me, like me. Same. And it was just like, what's what? going on here? What's going on? But then I didn't like it. But then I, I had a, the philosophy behind and I thought, oh my God, that's quite clever what the, what the producer has thought about it. And then I thought, maybe not the, the wine is wrong, I am wrong. So I have to, to go deeper into it. So I start buying orange wine, masses of orange wine, only drunk orange wine. And I got so fed up of orange wines, I couldn't drink it anymore. <laughs> and and now it, it was just like, and, and now it's still the same. I think I don't love all the orange. Uh, so orange is, I, I like it when it is a, a certain kind of freshness in it, when it is uh, not too heavy, not too rich. 
it has to it has to be a balance into the wine. Then then it's something I really love to drink, and it's very drinkable to me. So. No, I will. That's a, a a beautiful wine and beautiful story to end on. I think uh, we'll leave it there. But uh, thank you for this beautiful wine. Thank you, Klaus, Savold, and Christian, and, and Honey for joining us. This is a really Fantastic conversations with fantastic wines. And thank you to everyone here at Farah for hosting us in their test kitchen for us to taste some wines. So, cheers. cheers. Thank you so much. Cheers. Pleasure. Now we can empty the box. <laughs> <laughs> Without cameras, it's much more relaxed. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, where's the food? Yes.